What's up guys and gals, welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we'll be taking a look at a very special title. This is one of those games that nothing quite like it really exists on Steam. This is a singular role-playing open world adventure. And while it's very, very old school, it's also kind of a love letter to my childhood, or really anybody that was between the ages of like... I don't know, 12 and 25 in the late 90s. This is exactly the kind of game that I can remember booting up Windows ME and playing back in those days. It's very, very invocative. Or I guess I guess it's very, very indicative of a game like Morrowind or like Daggerfall or maybe Ultima Underworld or King's Field or something like that. This is a game that is effectively the video game equivalent of a period piece. And I've played it for about six or seven hours over the course of the last few days in order to prepare for this video. And I think my initial thoughts are ready. The game of the day is called Dread Delusion. And it's an open world RPG that takes place in a completely unique original world that's very much FromSoft inspired. Where nothing really makes sense. And yet the people that live inside of it sort of accept that nothing makes sense. Because it's a world that's constantly undergoing entropy and sort of change. It's a game where you can't rely on anything being there in 24 hours. And the culture of the game world sort of reflects that. So in Dread Delusion, this is a post-apocalyptic RPG where the world has shattered and it no longer exists in the down below. It does, but we can't really go down there. And all of humanity exists on kind of like these little floating islands that are all over the place. And they're constantly crashing into one another. They're constantly reconfiguring themselves. In order to deal with this, the world has dealt with it by effectively making magical maps that update themselves and constantly, that's one of the big research things in this world is how do you make a map that's always correct even though everything is moving around and you're going to help out with that process as well during the course of the game. Uh, but people have killed their gods in revenge for this happening. The gods are actually real, tangible things that exist. You can speak to them, you can touch them, they can give you blessings, they can give you curses. They're sort of like these occult freakish bugs, I guess. And some people worship the bugs, and some people want to hunt the bugs to extinction. And the people that wanted to hunt the bugs to extinction, uh, democracy prevailed, they killed all the bugs. And so now there are very few gods left, and the cults that support the few gods that are left are waging a never-ending war against the apostatic union, which are the guys that slew the gods. Effectively, they call themselves the Inquisition, and they're obsessed with hunting down whatever few gods remain and getting rid of them because they think that that will, like, fix the world and that the shattering is the gods' fault. So let's dive in. Let's play the game for about 30 minutes. There's... What is that right there? Huh. Let's play the game for about 30 minutes, and let's see if it's something that suits your fancy. This is a game that by no means... I don't think this is going to be a game for everybody... I don't think this is going to be a game that everybody's going to see and be like, yeah, dude, I want to play that right this second. But this is definitely a game for a certain type of gamer that was around, sort of around the time period where games like Arcanum were coming out of Myths and Magic Obscura. It's kind of a love letter to those games that came out in a time period where people were trying a lot of new things and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Uh, this game really, in my opinion, embodies those ideas of a strange world with strange mechanics and a lot of exploration. And there's some interesting hooks that this game can get into you if you are the type of gamer that this game is actively targeting. If after watching this you wanted to get the game for yourself, I got a link for you down below in the description. This game is in early access, but it is rapidly approaching 1.0 currently. <sighs> I can break that. Uh, it is rapidly approaching 1.0. It has new maps. It has lots of things to do. To give you some idea of the depth of content that's here, I've been playing for five or six hours in preparation for this video, and I have not even left the first major continent yet. Uh, I had a bridge pass that I was going to break out to get us into one of the new territories today, but that's a spike trap. I don't want to step on that, but I traded it in for a quest Hey, we got it on the first go I traded it in for a quest that took me to another zone And so I've done a lot of the things that are on this first starting continent But I haven't done all of them yet right now I'm just exploring 
because that's really what this game is all about. If you're the kind of RPG player that doesn't really care about challenge, doesn't really care too much about things like loot collection or anything else like that, you're just purely into exploration and what's over the next hill, this is probably a game that's really going to get under your skin because you can see the design philosophy of this game. And I'll show it to you if I remember once we get out of this dungeon. I saw a castle up on a hill and so I was like, I'm going to go inside that castle and see what's in there. Ooh, a fine ore. Nice. I need that. I was going to go inside the castle and see what's going on with it. Most of these locations will have some kind of prevailing narrative. A lot of it's going to be emergent. So you're going to get it by like reading lore that's in the area or there will be some kind of guy you can talk to. I'm getting shot at. Let's get this guy right here. Luckily, these bandits are not really a threat for me anymore. Oof, stamina is a little bit low. Let me pull back real fast. Oh, that guy's drinking a health potion. Where's the other person? Oh, there's a guy up there too. The shield guy we got to deal with as well. There we go. Knock the shield back. Take him out. These other guys are probably accessible through that door up there. Uh, let me get a health potion bumping right there. I should probably actually get a stamina popping as well. I haven't slept in a while, so my stamina is decreasing on me. There's very, very light survival mechanics in this game. You don't need to, like, feed and water your character. Although, I think that would be a good idea for the game to have, like, a hardcore mode where there's, like, food around and you've got to feed and water yourself. But... Your stamina does gradually go down the longer you go without sleeping. And so every now and again, I got to freshen myself up with a little bit of adventure meth in order to, you know, really get the eyes jiggling. You guys are... Oh, okay. This guy's got armor on. I wanted to see if I could knock back his shield. He's stuck right now. That actually, like, kind of works out for me. I'm okay with him being stuck. There we go. We'll knock him down. Uh, every enemy in this game that's humanoid has the same death animation. That's one thing. I think they could probably mix up a little bit. It does get a tiny bit repetitive. On top of that, when I kill these guys over here, I'll point out another one of my pet peeves that I have. Take him out, and when he hits the ground, you got to wait for the entire death animation and for them to go poof before the loot pops out. Very, very simple thing to make the game feel better. Make the loot come out when the first frame of the animation starts when they die rather than when they poof. Uh, some of the enemies have reasonably decent death animations that take a little while to get done. And throughout the course of the five or six hours that I've spent with the game, I've spent a lot of time waiting for a guy to finish his death animation so the loot will pop out. Just one of those little changes. It's not a major thing, but I think it would make the game feel a little bit better to play. Get you right there. Are you going to try to shoot me with a bow or are you going to try to close? All right, let's get that guy right there. There is a parry system in the game. It is quite generous. It's very, very easy to figure out. It's not really going to be much of a head scratcher when the enemy swings, just parry. And they get knocked back a little bit, and then you get an opening to hit them. What's up with this door? Is it barred from the other side? Okay, so it's barred from the other side. So any way that we can get in there is going to have to be somewhere else. They gave me a truth potion when I came in here, like a potion of true sight. Sometimes there's false walls in this game, and you can just walk through them. But they will look like a normal solid wall, and you've got to drink a truth potion to open your eyes and actually see stuff like that. That opens right there. Where does this go? You can get up on roofs and things like that, by the way. Looks like it goes to some kind of alleyway or something down there. I'm not going to drop down just yet, because I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen when I drop down. Can I break these floors? Sometimes these little areas that are, like, scaffolded over... Or they've been patched, you can hit them with your sword and they'll break and then you can fall through them. But exploration is 100% the focus of this. Are you guys going to try to hurt me? They are. Uh, they have fireballs and stuff. Okay, I need a health potion. That hurt like hell. Alright, all good to go. Back on in we go. I do love the addition of drinking animations and things. These guys... I don't know. These guys look like they're from the Apostatic Union, and I'm friendly with them, so I don't know why they're upset with me right now. Circle around them and get them right there. And we got some lockpicks inside of there. We got some coins. We got some kind of potion, a shielding potion. I haven't really used that potion yet. As of right now, the amount of space that you have available is kind of, like, confined in the UI. You can only have, like, four potions on your hotbar at a time and only have a couple of spells at a time. And so, I've got to rotate them. This guy right here, though. There we go. Let's get him with a backstab. There is a stealth system in the game. I haven't really been using it altogether that much. That right there is a power-up called a delusion. 
This is the way by which you level up. Uh, so effectively in this game, you do not get XP from fighting enemies. You do not get XP from using skills and having them upgrade naturally. In this world, you find things called delusions. And if you get enough of them, you get a level up. The design philosophy is very clear right there. The game wants you to explore. It wants you to go out and find secret things. And in those places will be squirreled away delusions. Now, another thing that's really cool about this game, if you can see something, you can get to it. Nothing is off limits to you inside this game. So, for example, those little flying islands up there, I bet you you can get to them. That little flying island up there, you can 100% get to it. There's a quest to get to that one right there that opens up another quest and gives you a big old lore dump. And there's a library up there. I mean, there's these little bridges. You need bridge passes to get across those. I haven't even been to that entire continent over there yet. I haven't even been to that entire continent over that way yet. Uh, there's another one over that way that I haven't been to yet. I just got a pass that will allow me to maybe go to... Well, there's one island, and I can't really particularly see it right now, but there's an island with a city on stilts. I got a pass to go there, like, literally before I started recording. This lift needs a key. Okay, so in order to get up to there, whatever that might be, we need to find a key, I guess. That's going to happen to you a lot. There's a lot of, like, progress gating in this game where sometimes you're going to get to a location and your skills aren't going to be high enough for you to get through, like, a door and lockpick it. And that's just going to be the end of your adventure until you come back later. Where does this go? Uh, that's going to be the end of your adventure until you either have the key or you have the skill check or until you have something else. This is definitely a game that I would recommend playing with a notepad. It's an old school game like that where writing down locations and the stuff that you have found there and the fact that you could not access it might be a good idea. I might need to use an agility spell right here. I don't know if I can make that jump without an agility spell. There we go, we agility spelled it. I actually, I think we were down here. Who is this guy? Now look here, this is my tree and that's my loot, so get lost. Uh, do you live here? Yes, I've been here for 60 years since before the damned apostates blasted the place to smithereens. What is this town? Time was, it was a town called Rustburg on account of all the merchants selling Imbarian junk. You see, there's an old Emberian ruin up there. Plenty of detritus, though, and all the time the town's been here, they never did crack open the big old doors. Some of that magic metal is going to still hold tight no matter how many cannons you fire at it. Why is it such a wreck? Well, about 40 years ago was the God War. The Epistates, I guess we call them the Union now, uh, they caught wind of some Wiccan holdouts and blasted the whole town with a fortress ship. Hallowtown was fine, so most of the folk just moved there. Nobody ever really rebuilt Rustburg. Okay. Uh, do you know a way into town? You need to get into the big stone tower, but there's two ways around. You can go the long way with all the goblins and moths, or you can go the special way. Can you tell me the special way? I guess you seem like an alright guy. When there were Wiccans living here, they hid a nearby bridge with magic. It's right there, but you gotta use a truth potion to see it. Let's you sneak past all the gobbos real good. Alright. There's also a brewing system in this game. There is crafting. Pretty much everything you loot in this game is going to be upgraded. There's not a whole lot of loot variety in the game, but the loot that you find is consequential and will give you stat boost to pretty much like a skill check. And then on top of that, all of the gear that you find is upgradable. And so you'll find crafting materials around. So just because you find a wizard robe doesn't mean that that wizard robe is going to stay in the state that it currently is forever. Instead, you're supposed to be finding crafting materials to sort of like chain upgrade all of these things that you're finding throughout the game. So, for example, the sword that I have right now is a level 3 sword. I've upgraded it twice. Oh, we can actually chart this place. Interesting. Well, then let's chart this place. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner, I've got a book. If I press the F key right here, this game does not come with a map. You have to make your own. And so there's a quest chain that you'll unlock where they give you one of the magical journals that cartographers use to track the islands, even though they're in constant motion. And once you have that, every now and again, the game is going to kind of nudge you and be like, this looks like an interesting place. And then you 
are going to use your cartography book and it's going to fill in the map a little bit. And the map does track where you are. This will help you keep track of where you've been, where you haven't been. I don't think you can leave notes on it or anything, but I would like to be able to leave notes on it. Being able to create custom pins that are like, skill check here I couldn't get through, needs 35 lock picking on like these little buildings and stuff like that would be actually super helpful. So being able to leave a pin or whatever on here I think would be a really cool feature that would make it so you didn't need to have a notepad in real life in order to remember what you have and haven't done. He said something about a bridge with a truth potion. I guess I can take a look around and see if we can do that. Take the stamina potion off. I only have three truth potions. I don't know how long they last for. Uh, not very long appears to be the answer to that question. Oh yeah, there's a magic bridge right over here that you couldn't see. I jumped over that. Huh, this game is absolutely rabbit holed with little things like that, that like if you pay attention during conversations and things, you will inevitably find out about some of these little interactions and things that you can do. There was probably, that's probably a magic bridge right there too because I would have come over here and looted that little herb before I left. But for right now, we need to find something to do. I do have a mission to break into a guy's house. Apparently he's got something that the Thieves Guild wants in his basement. And so as one of my tests, they want me to go into his basement and figure out how to get in there. I guess we could give that a go. On my way over, I saw a bunch of thieves over here by this manor looking place. So I figured we'd dive on in here too and just kind of see what they've got inside, and that's pretty much the entire game. They've really tapped into something, I think, human and primal with this game, which is just the desire to go look at the thing and figure out if there's going to be something useful over there. I can't express enough how much of a breath of fresh air this game is for people that enjoy exploration, and they don't want to be told, they want to be shown. People in this game, when you talk to them, they, like, allude to things. Occasionally, they'll just flat out tell you, which is a... Ooh. There's a secret door right there. All right, let's see what's in the secret door. Move that candle right there. Hey, there we go. A ring of feather foot. You cannot take damage from falling. Often used by acrobats and burglars. If the fall is too great for the wear of this charm... Or, no fall is too great for the wear of this charm. It's always advisable to make sure one can return from whence they plunge. Okay. It looks like these right here. Hey, alright. Let me put that ring on, though. That's a really useful ring. Fall damage exists in this game, and it can be kind of catastrophic. Thus far, the game is not that challenging or difficult. I haven't really had any problems with any of the content that the game presented to me. Uh, we got some XP right there, so that's good. This is an alchemy station. You should learn the alchemy rules in this game. I'm not going to spoil anything, but alchemy allows you to do very interesting things in this game that will save you a lot of money. We could use a rest, and it's kind of nighttime, so I'll sleep till morning. Because we're not in a safe location, we can be attacked while we're sleeping. But I was willing to take the risk. Uh, the place is totally and completely covered with little locations like this that just have little hidden object puzzles. Uh, there are harvestables around. So, for example, over here, this little guy that's floating. This is a bug. It cries silk. And there are different tiers of them. You need this silk for upgrading your gear and also just for selling. And so, you're going to want to pet these little guys whenever you see them and get the silk out of them. Let's get back to our Thieves Guild quest. So, welcome to Hallowshire. This is one of the big cities in the first main area. It's one of those RPG things where they say it's like the biggest, most populous city and there's like nine people inside of it. But this is going to be the focal point for a lot of your early game adventures. Now, the guy I think we're trying to steal from is inside this building right here. They have said that this room, which we're trying to get into, is only accessible from the outside somewhere. I'm guessing it probably has something to do with, like, this right here. That there may be some kind of, like, true sight thing that we need to have access to in order to get in. It may be a good idea 
Yeah, it might be a good idea to true sight potion around here. It's also possible that the access way may be through, like, the sewers, possibly. Looks like there's windows back there, but none that I can actually immediately jump through. But we do have this right here, which goes up and underneath. Let's see if maybe there's something that I've missed inside of here. So there's a lockpicking door right here. The lockpicking minigame in this game I think could be improved a lot. Uh, the lockpicking minigame is basically you just rolling a die until you get what the game wants you to get. And so it's all RNG. There's no like skill involved. There's no anything else involved. That's probably our way in would be my guess. I don't have any lockpicks left though. I broke all of them. So we're kind of like stuck inside the poo water with nothing but disappointment in our throats. But while we're in town, I can show you the upgrade system. It's very, very simple. Uh, you're going to cruise around, you're going to find iron ore, you're going to find fine ore, you're going to find emberite ore uh, with silk. You're going to find silk, fine silk, and some other stuff. You can also get those by other means, but I don't want to spoil because the exploration and the learning about the universe is a big part of this title. But anyways, if I had the ore, which I do, I could upgrade this armor right here into Outlaw's armor from Rusty Armor. That'll give us 30 to our defensive stat and plus 8 to our attack. Gear in this game serves as a way for you to sort of like get around things. So if you look at the robes that I'm wearing right now, they give me plus 20 to spell casting. And the hat that I'm wearing gives me plus 10 to charm. Upgrading this stuff is a really good idea because you can hot swap your gear whenever you want. And most of the quests tell you exactly what the threshold is that you need in order to complete like the dialogue or whatever else and so one of your big tasks in this game is going to be upgrading all of your gear and kind of like moving around all of your stuff to get past skill checks and to get to the next part of the game until i have more lock picks there's not going to be much that i can do right here like i said i would like to see the lock picking game kind of fiddled with like i know they're trying to keep it as like a skill check for right now but Getting rid of a little bit of the RNG that goes into it would be nice as well. Honestly, I think I would probably prefer that they just be like, you're not skilled enough to pick this lock, and then if you are, you automatically achieve it. There's some lock picks. Big old pack of three. I'll probably come back later on once I have full lock picks to try to get in there through the sewers because it requires a six check. You can level up your lock picking through the use of guile. Uh, so when you get delusions, you increase your stats, and all of these stats are linked uh, to other attributes that will go up by five each time that you increase them. And so, for example, you know your lockpick will go up by five when you increase agility. Your run speed will go up, and your jump height will go up. Uh, lore is the same thing, but with increasing like your wisdom. These guys down here are going to be for increasing your charm. Stuff like that. I do have a quest to turn in. I can't take damage from falling, so, like, who cares? We'll just jump off right there. And I think I have a quest with this little lady in the tent over here. She wanted me to map and chart uh, the entire realm. And I have done that now. I'm kind of a completionist. I don't move on to new zones until I've done everything I possibly can in old zones. It's sort of a curse that I live with. But I'm hoping she gives me something good. This is a low magic universe. So magic is kind of like actively practiced, but it's very gated as to who's allowed to have it. There's almost always a quest when you want to learn a new spell. The scholar is engrossed. Uh, I have cipher charts to hand in. These will do nicely. The detail is impressive, and it looks like you've completed the entire region. I'll throw in some extra coin for your efforts. Okay. How much money do I have? Money's not really a problem once you figure out how to get it. I'm not going to spoil how to easily farm lots and lots of money in this game. You'll figure it out. Uh, the exploration, once again, I have to be very careful when filming a video like this because the exploration is a huge component of what makes the game interesting. So if I just, like, say those things on a video, someone that buys the game knows how to do the thing, and learning how to do the thing is actually kind of one of those, ama those major emergent values of the title that is hidden from you for a reason. Keep exploring. You'll figure it out. This guy over here said he would take me to a new land when I'm ready. So let's sail to the Clockwork Kingdom. 
There are four rules of flying with Misha. Don't lean over the side. Don't feed the jellyfish. Do not throw up in the boat. Last rule, we never go inland in the Clockwork Kingdom. Once you leave the landing site, you are on your own. You ready for the voyage? All right, let's go. So he's going to put himself over here, and we're going to go along for a little ride. It doesn't look like I can move around the boat while we're actually being flown over here. There was another boat that I saw that was going in between locations, but I can't find it now. And so I would like to find that boat, too, and figure out where it goes. On a certain level, the exploration in this game kind of reminds me of early World of Warcraft, too, where sometimes you would see, like, an airship, and you're just like, I don't know where this goes. There's nobody else on it. I guess I'll get on and go see. And there was sort of, like, this knowledge that you would have that other players didn't have by knowing how the world interconnects. Obviously, that was all gone within a year of release, but in the first few months, knowing the paths to get from point A to point B was actually pretty cool. This game kind of has that same similar thing going on. Oh, is that a tree that's impaled on a root over there? That makes like a bridge to get across to that little area? It's kind of cool. This place is absolutely pockmarked with like these interesting little visual locations and you can get to all of them. Which means that if you've got the explorer's gene inside of you, I think this game is going to bite you in a very real way, the way that it did to me. There will be people that complain about the graphics. Like I said, this is a period piece. And it's an unapologetic period piece. This game is trying to show you what games were like in like the late 90s. And it's pretty unflinching in that respect. There's a lot of quality of life here that does exist. But they make you unlock it first. You have to do quest chains in order to like get to the quality of life. Things like fast travel, for example, are very, very limited. But you've got to do like quests and you've got to explore in order to unlock the fast travel. Um, the quality of life is there it's just not immediate like you start without a map and a compass too you're just wandering in the world and by wandering you get access to the cartography system like i said it's clear from the design schema that everything here is meant to revolve around exploration and that's a rare thing with an rpg usually they make it surround either the narrative or they make it surround the advancement of your character this game those two things only happen if you explore first it is the first step and so Mikael looks off into the distance or the mountains with unreadable expression and shakes his head here we are home shit home or what's left of it since Misha never goes inland this is where we part I'm not going to ask you your business it's the best you do not tell but if you want to cross the gate bridge talk to the royal factor when you get to Feropolis keep your head down and trust nobody you do not want to be tangled in the machinist's intrigue okay Wise plan, don't die, yeah? Well, I'm not planning on dying, but I don't know if I'm ready for this place either. Luckily, there's a convenient save point at the moment that I can just hit real fast. Uh, the game does not actively save while you're... I mean, so I've seen it save when I'm walking around the world, but how that matters when you leave the game and come back, I don't know. Either way, there's save crystals. Every time you see one, you should hit it real fast to avoid losing progress. Luckily, the game is not intrinsically altogether that dangerous from what I've seen so far. It's actually almost like a cozy RPG in the respect that I've only really come across a couple of enemies that are a major threat. There's like some spider things over here. How bad are they? I mean, I'm capable of harming them, so that's a good opening salvo. Dodge him. Let's see if we can put a little bit of love and touch and squeezing on him. If in doubt in this title, circle strafe. Almost every enemy is defeated by circle strafing. That's probably something they should sort out. I think the game could probably do with a little bit more challenge and a little bit more threat. Uh, just to make the exploration kind of put your heart in your throat a little bit more aggressively. But the game functions perfectly fine at the difficulty level that it's at right now because exploration is kind of the focus. The combat system is kind of too simple for them to put like a ridiculous amount of challenge into it anyways. I do think that the combat and the item variety is actually kind of a weakness of the game as of right now. Where there's not like maces. So far I think I've seen like daggers and swords and that's it in my six or seven hours. There's no spears. You know, there's throwing weapons, there's a bow, and there's an assortment of swords. But I would like to see that variety kind of hammered out where there's like maces, hammers, flails, things of that nature that you can equip. They don't even need to change up the animations altogether that much. Just being able to pick and choose what you want to run and maybe giving like a stat boost 
uh, to different things for different weapons would be cool. Like hammers give you a little bit of defense. You know, spears give you a little bit of reach that you don't have with other weapons but deal less damage. Maces give you like some form of armor penetration. You've got something like a flail. You know, maybe that increases your attack value. The border's closed. Let me through. I need to go home. Not happening. Get out of here. I did need to talk to the factor because Misha gave me a forged passport into the clockwork realm. It's over here in my inventory. And as you can see, it's got a crude smiley face drawn on it. So I don't think it's going to hold up to scrutiny when the Gestapo gets here. And so he said I needed to go to Rustburg. I'm sorry, not Rust. Yeah, I needed to go to Ferropolis. That's what it was. The city on stilts. That's probably it right there. And he said I needed to talk to, like, the head factor in order to get it validated and turned into, like, a real passport so that I can come and grow go across that bridge as much as I please. Nothing up here. But I'm inclined to look because in my experience, there's always something hidden behind, like, the little nooks and crannies of this game. You're going to want to be a cranny gazer, all right? You're going to want to be a nook surveyor. You're going to want to get in there and actually take a look around. I need a... I took my stamina potion off my hotbar. But I definitely need a stamina potion right about now. Items and spells. Truth potion. You can go away for a minute. Stamina potion. It's better than sleeping. Disregard the bags up under my eyes. Alright. That guy's been defeated. It looks like this is maybe some kind of farmland over here. I don't know. Everything's so accursed in this game, and nothing's ever working right. It's side effects of the cataclysm. We got snow, though, which is pretty cool. What I get the impression of from exploring this game is that it's kind of like exploring old dwarvish ruins in Morrowind or in like Oblivion. You don't know exactly what happened or what went wrong. But everything seems to be very rusty and destroyed. A poison shuriken. That's new. Selling throwing weapons can be pretty lucrative. And they're like all over the place. Some enemies just drop them. And so like throwing knives and whatnot are worth two gold. I've gone so far as to say this game has an economy that functions entirely off of just throwing weapons. But you can also do interesting alchemical things with the throwing weapons and whatnot. So keep an eye on that too. Their eyes go wide when they see you and they make an occult sign. King's mercy, how did you get past the wards? They grab a frying pan from a nearby shelf and they brandish it unconvincingly. Stay back, in the name of its majesty I abjure thee, you have no power here. Calm down, I'm not going to hurt you. They lower the pan. You're not one of them, are you? You're actually traveling out here. Oh, please, your majesty, watch over this brave soul. Who did you think I was? A rogue Myrmidon, bewitched by the saboteur to disobey the king, or perhaps even a corrupted one. One of the landship owners told me it's spreading hereabouts. I hear them, you know, the clawing and hammering at my door every other night. Sometimes it's like they're knocking, and sometimes they say things, but I don't listen. It's lies. They grimace. Just mind yourself out there, all right? Okay. Best of luck to you. Seem kind of paranoid and hysterical, so I'm going to get out of here before I get bonked with a cooking implement. I already went up there. What's inside this little building over here? And also, what are those? There's been a number of things that I've seen throughout the realm that I don't know quite how to interact with them yet, but it's clear from their placement that they're important. It is of utmost gravity that you immediately report all signs of corruption to the proper authorities in your district. Know the omens. Unusual behavior, physical defects with livestock and animals, confusion in finding your way through familiar places, mirages of the eye and ear, taste and smell of lilac when there is no lilac, Long live the king. Huh. Okay. Doesn't look like there's a way to get up in there. That little bridge connects on that side. Maybe I'll go check this city out, though. Might not be a bad idea to have, like, an anchor point that I can teleport back to. You do have a hearthstone in this game. It's on, like, kind of a chunky cooldown. Oh, my God, there's little ones. So I'm guessing in this place, ow, I'm guessing that in this place, mundane objects become enchanted and start, like, trying to murder people. Just judging from, like, the art style here. The enemy variety in this game seems to be reasonably decent. Once again, I haven't found, like, any of them challenging or difficult just yet. Maybe when I get further on... Okay, so they've got a little bit of, like, Utini Jawa action happening over here got like a giant combine that just 
cruises around. Looks like I can get on board it too. I'm gonna get on board it. Yeah, I've got myself a new John Deere. Like John Deere in the heat of the night. We's farmers now. There's a guy over there. I don't know if he's gonna be a friendly guy. Or he's gonna be mean, but you know. Barred from the other side. This is Dread Delusion. If you're looking for an RPG that is absolutely chock-a-block with exploration and takes place inside of a world that you've never seen before that leans very, very heavily in kind of like a different post-apocalyptic direction than a lot of the other stalker-inspired stuff out there. This is one of those games that I think fits in very, very well with, like, Lunacid. I think it fits in very well with games like King's Field. I think it fits in very, very well with games like Daggerfall or like the earlier stages of Morrowind, things of that nature. And for me, this was personally a teleporter back to my childhood that I think instantaneously like grabbed me and made me want to play it. It's unabashedly kind of like nostalgia bait, but it backs it up with a giant weird world that is worth exploring where there's something around every corner and there's something hidden behind every pipe and every location has like 10 ways to access it. While it doesn't quite have the character building or the narrative building so far that a lot of other games have, there are little things in there. There is some base building in this game. I have a base of operations. Uh, that's like a steamship that I fly out of. I haven't gotten it working yet, but I have been purchasing the upgrades for it. Everything in the game happens on a time scale too, so I haven't played long enough to see the outcomes of certain quests. Uh, there are certain locations where I've dispelled curses or I've resolved some kind of thing, and there was a pop-up being like, your decisions will have an effect here. Like, the city will begin to regrow, but that will have consequences or something else like that. You've got to kind of like swing back to previous locations that you've already been like a couple weeks later as well and kind of take a look. Even things like upgrading my flying fortress, which does not fly yet. It's just kind of a fortress right now. I'll give you an example. I built like a recreation area inside of it. It said to come back in a while and it'll be done. You've actually got to wait for the contractors to finish building the thing that you purchased. And I haven't been back there yet to go and look at it. Uh, everything happens on a time scale in this game, and sometimes you don't know what the outcome is going to be for a branching path quest until later on down the line. And so there are also things that I haven't really seen how far reaching the results are going to be of like a major narrative point that I resolved just yet. And so, like I said, everything in this game is emergent. Everything in this game is not really going to be explained to you. You just got to kind of feel it out and see where things go. But I dig that about it. Some people might find the esoteric nature of that to be sort of disorienting or difficult to come to grips with. But every time that happens to me, I just start exploring again and I just like wander off into the horizon and like find a new thing to work on and like a new place to level up and a new place to fiddle with. And so it works for me as a player and I was also of the age that I mentioned earlier uh, during the time period where games like this were coming out. And in fact, I think this was the best period of RPGs, uh, not really to be competed with yet by modern gaming. And so Dread Delusion, I highly recommend it. I think the game's pretty cool. I think it could use some more depth to the combat. I think it could definitely use a lot more item variety uh, along the way to kind of like make your character unique and decide what weapons you want to upgrade and what you don't. But what I've seen so far has also been satisfying and emergent, and so I have no problem really, I guess, recommending it. This right here is a fast travel point. They're not like everywhere, but they seem to be near most of the major locations. And so if you're at like a major location, like a new city or something like that, look around. You'll probably find one like in the sewers or something. Uh, you've got to do a quest in order to unlock the ability to interact with those. They're not going to work when you first come around. But keep exploring. You'll figure out how to unlock them. My name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so you don't have to. Today up on the chopping block, we are fooling around with a very, very rare and unique title called Dread Delusion. There is truly no other game quite like it on Steam that's purely focused on exploration and kind of lore dumps and just making the player look into the horizon and being like, I want to get there. How do I get there? It's kind of a rare thing. And so anyways, I'll see y'all tomorrow with something hot and fresh off the indie skillet. For now, it's time for me to go. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I'll catch y'all later. Bye, folks.